creation is an essential feature of God. His own witness to himself in the Holy Scriptures begins with the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth is a Hebrew expression meaning that God created everything. It's like when we sing God bless America and we talk about from sea to shining sea. We mean the entire country, yes, Alaska and Hawaii too. So God is the creator of all things. The scriptures begin with this essential characteristic of God. All of our creeds begin with this essential characteristic of God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Whenever the Psalms want to distinguish the true and living God from the idols of the nations, they say that the idols of the nations are false, but God made the heavens. Dr. Charles Perry at the St. Louis Seminary said that if you wanted to take out a want, a help wanted ad, where you were going to ask for a God, you would say this, qualifications, maker of heaven and earth, all other applicants need not apply. For the maker of heaven and earth is by definition almighty and all-knowing and all the rest of the attributes of God. And if God is not almighty and all-knowing and all of these things, then he cannot be the maker of heaven and earth. So being the maker of heaven and earth is an essential characteristic of the true and living God. <coughs> it is this essential characteristic of the true and living God that modern man has attributed to something else. They have attributed the creation of heaven and earth to forces of physics, geology, chemistry, and biology. And insofar as that modern man attributes the creation to the forces of physics, geology, chemistry, and biology, they have created for themselves a god, and they bow down and worship it in their hearts. This is their idol. We have taken an essential feature of God and we have attributed it to something else other than God and by doing so, we have created for ourselves an idol. There are certain modern Freudian slips that indicate that this is so. Not too many years ago, I was listening to an interview of a medical doctor on NPR. She was an expert in childbirth. She was speaking about the inherent risks of pregnancies with twins or triplets. And in her discussion of the risks involved in pregnancies with twins and triplets, she stated that the womb is designed to be a one-person compartment. And as soon as she said it, she realized what she had said, and she quickly added, designed by evolution. You see, she said it was designed. As soon as you say that something is designed, that means that there is a designer. So even though modern man attributes the creation to the forces of geology, physics, chemistry, and biology, they still personify those forces and make them into persons which design things. The reason that they do this is because they are replacing a person, and if you replace a person, you must replace a person with a person or persons. <clears throat> On PBS, there was a documentary about the dust bowl. At the beginning of the documentary, the historian who was providing the commentary on the documentary described the geological and biological conditions of the high plains. Talked about the grasses that grow on the high plains. <coughs> and during the description, he at some point stated that Mother Nature had solved the problem of dust blowing around on the high plains by having these particular grasses grow on the high plains to hold the dirt down. This makes sense as a preliminary to the documentary because he's going to go on and talk about how the homesteaders moved out there, plowed up the ground, and set the stage for the dust bowl. My question is this, why would Mother Nature 
extra care about dirt flying around. If Mother Nature is, in fact, the forces of physics, geology, chemistry, and biology, why should she even care if dirt blows around on the high plains? They're just impersonal forces. They don't care. But by characterizing those forces as if they care and as if they solve problems, modern man commits the Freudian slip of admitting that he has a God. He has replaced one person with another person. This is the idolatry of modern man. And where does idolatry lead? Idolatry inevitably leads to fornication. <clears throat> now here, fornication should be understood in a comprehensive fashion. Fornication includes all sexual immorality. It includes adultery. It includes premarital sex. It includes promiscuity. It includes homosexuality. It includes the use of pornography. Fornication should be understood holistically, and idolatry, no matter when it happens in human history, leads to fornication. Take Exodus chapter 32 as the example. They build the golden calf. They say, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron announces a festival to the golden calf the next day. At the festival, the people of Israel sit down to eat and to drink, and then they get up to play. That's what the translation says. They get up to play. And the Hebrew word can be translated play. The Hebrew word can also be translated laughter. But the Hebrew word also can be translated sexual immorality, fornication. When Isaac and Rebekah were sojourning with Abimelech, Isaac told, Isaac told Abimelech that Rebekah was his sister. And one day Abimelech was looking out of his window and Isaac was playing with Rebekah. The same Hebrew verb. And whatever it was that Isaac was doing with Rebekah when Isaac was playing with Rebekah, it tipped Abimelech off. Hey, that's not your sister. That's your wife. You lied to us. So the people worship an idol and they rise to play. We do have an English word that matches this Hebrew word pretty closely, and that is the word sport. Sport can mean football, basketball, baseball, and all of those things. But an older member of our congregation who has now passed away remembers a time when certain places in Danville were called sporting districts. You can guess what they were doing there. They arose to sport. They worshipped an idol. It led to fornication. The ancients worshipped Baal. They thought that Baal was a rain god. Rain brings fertility to the earth. So the ancient Canaanites figured that when they needed rain, they should remind Baal to send fertility to the earth. They decided to remind Baal to send fertility to the earth by being fertile themselves upon the earth. And so the Canaanites built shrines and temples to their god Baal, where they paid shrine prostitutes to be the religious functionaries at those temples. And whenever the farmers wanted it to rain, they would all go into the shrine prostitutes, take advantage of her services, and pray the rain would come. Idolatry leads to fornication. And that is just as true with modern man as it is with ancient man. In 1980, the famed astronomer Carl Sagan published a book entitled Cosmos. When I was a young man, I read this book with great interest. He described the planets of the solar system. He described the rain on Venus. He described the craters of Mars and the rings of Saturn. He had all of these beautiful pictures in the 1980s from the Voyager satellites who took all these beautiful pictures and they were right there in this book. And somewhere, tucked away in a couple of paragraphs in this book, Carl Sagan states, the young people of the day should be liberated from the religious mores of the past 
in regard to sexual conduct. And the reason that he said this was, is because the sexual mores of the past were only in place because it was before the time of contraception and a child would be conceived and a child would need a father and a mother to care for and raise it. But modern man has invented contraceptives. And because modern man has invented contraceptives, he argues, the birth of a child can be prevented. And therefore, young people need no longer be constrained by the sexual practices of the past. And when he said sexual practices of the past, he meant the sexual commandments of the true and living God, although he would not say that because he never admitted that the true and living God actually existed. Why, in a book about astronomy and the planets and the craters and the rings of Saturn and the construction of the galaxy, does he tell me about sexual immorality? What does that have to do with anything having to do with astronomy, and yet there it is? Worship an idol leads to fornication. It's an idol. In 1990, Ada Lindemann published a book entitled Historical Criticism, where she talks about evolutionary research into the Bible. This is all the rage in all the universities in Europe, and frankly, in most of them in the United States as well. Where they say that the Bible is not God's word, rather it is human opinion which has evolved over time from simple religious ideas to very complicated religious ideas. And in this book, Ada Lindemann laments how much of the universities of Europe's budgets are put towards the research of contraceptives. With all of the medical problems that we could put our money to to solve, we are putting our money to this, she said. And she lists the figures in her book. The senior Dr. Scare at the Fort Wayne Seminary says it is interesting how modern societies play fast and loose with the Sixth Commandment, but they insist upon the enforcement of the Fifth, the Seventh, and the Eighth Commandments. Modern man insists that his government enforces laws against murder with a notable exception of abortion. Modern man insists that his government enforces laws against stealing. Modern man insists that his government enforces laws against falsehood. Even in our republic, the freedom of speech and freedom of the press, there are still laws on the books against slander and libel, and they are enforced. But when it comes to the Sixth Commandment, that is where modern man thinks that he can be licentious. And he insists that his government enforce no laws forbidding anything. Idolatry inevitably leads to fornication. If you have committed fornication, therefore, or if you are committing fornication, you have worshipped, or are worshipping, an idol. You have not just broken some little commandment that's way down on the list. You have broken the first one. There is something that you fear, love, and trust in more than God, and that is why you commit the fornication. This has to be so because there is no other logical connection between the two things. When you stop and think about it, why on earth should idolatry lead to fornication? That doesn't really make logical sense. And yet, as I have outlined this morning, historically speaking, that has always been the case. And the reason is simple. Is that people use fornication to heighten their own power, or they use fornication to escape from their problems, or they use fornication for their own selfish pleasure. In any of those cases, the idol that the person in question is worshipping is himself. And idolatry has always been that way. Idolatry is always a veil for a person to worship himself. So women of the congregation, your bodies are created by God to bring forth new life into the world. The man's body is not created in this way. And the modern word pregnant really doesn't capture.
capture it, so let's use the old word, with child. For when you bring forth children into the world, you are holding the hand of Almighty God. And you are bringing forth creation into the world. When you nurture that child at your breasts, you are holding the hand of God and bringing forth life into the world, nurturing and raising it together with Almighty God. Women of the congregation, your bodies are therefore holy. And just as no man entered the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament unless he had the call from God to do so, so also no man shall enter you unless he has the call from Almighty God to do so because you are holy. Men of the congregation, be men. And the chief man of all humanity is your Lord Jesus Christ. He is the man of all men who does not take a bride until he lays down his life for her. Who does not take his bride to church and give his bride to church his body and the sacrament of the altar until he has laid down that body on the cross for her. That's being a man. So a man does not offer his body to a woman until he has laid down his life for her. And men of the congregation, how do you lay down your life for her? This is how you do it. You take a simple vow to have her and to hold her for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. To pledge her your sexual fidelity until death parts you. Take that vow before God and before witnesses, and then each and every day of your married life together, you lay down your life for her, and therefore may offer your body to her, even as the Lord Jesus Christ offers his body to the church to purify her and to cleanse her from all idolatry and to take away every spot, wrinkle, and stain, and to present her to himself as a radiant church. Any other Lord and Savior is only a man. In the name of Jesus. <laughs>